See, this plane is not what you think. America's XB-70 is Mach 3 Super Bomber, but you've probably never heard of it. The Valkyrie was the largest and fastest bomber the U.S. has ever constructed. Nevertheless, the gigantic six-engine aircraft capable of speeds of up to Mach 3 was never put into production, and the only surviving prototype may be found in a museum. Want to know more? Hey guys, welcome to Military Planes, where we tell you about warplanes, from the currently famous in the air to the most advanced around the world. So stay with us till the end of this video so you don't miss out on any of this information. But before we proceed, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell symbol so that you don't miss out on any of our wonderful videos in the future. And let's get started. Following World War II, there was a period of enormous advancements in supersonic flight. During the Korean War, the first jet versus jet fighter duels occurred over Korea, and a new breed of jet-powered heavy bombers appeared to replace prop-powered classics such as the Boeing B-29B-50 Superfortress. The iconic United States Air Force heavy bomber then evolved into the eight-engine Boeing B-52 Stratofortress, which added a very high altitude, 50,000 feet bombing capability. To address this threat, the Soviets deployed a series of interceptors until its missile defense network became the true threat to American bomber crews. During the second half of the 1950s, the company's major development product was the XB-70 Valkyrie, a supersonic strategic bomber that was to employ Mach 3 plus speeds to breach enemy airspace while carrying a nuclear warload and depart the danger area before the adversary could effectively react. The aircraft was designed to replace the legendary B-52 in the high-flying bomb delivery duty and to operate with the U.S. Strategic Air Command as part of the North American European defense against a full-fledged Soviet nuclear attack. The new aircraft's principal feature would be its natural speed, which would theoretically allow it to outpace any intercepting aerial foe or ground-launched threats. However, developments in missile technology by the Soviets rendered such aircraft obsolete until the 1960s, as evidenced by the shooting down of a high-altitude Lockheed U-2 above the Soviet Union in the 1960 Gary Powers incident. However, before missile technology came to dominate war strategists' fantasies, the high-altitude bomber concept remained a realistic battlefield capability. During this time, defense companies continued to research various nuclear delivery methods at a time when the U.S. nuclear defense network was centered on a triad approach in which aircraft, submarines, and land-based launchers collaborated to deliver nuclear ballistic missiles against the enemy. The new USAF bomber had to have a cruising speed of Mach 3 and a flying altitude of above 70,000 feet. The range was an important factor because the bomber would have to go large distances, therefore this value was centered around 10,500 miles. The aircraft would be no larger than the existing B-52 in order to employ the existing infrastructure for the new product. The aircraft's gross weight would be limited to 490,000 pounds. A four-person crew was planned, including the pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier. The North American submission best met the USAF requirement, and it was chosen as the winner in December of that year, with a contract issued in January. The winning entry of Valkyrie was chosen from another contest held in early 1958 to name the aircraft. The USAF gave it the formal development name XB-70. Work began at a rapid rate, but budget constraints hampered the program throughout 1958 and 1959. The USAF was allowed to evaluate an XB-70 mock-up aircraft in March of the latter, which, of course, revealed some additional requirements as well as adjustments by the branch. The design was officially shown to the American public in 1960. The aircraft featured one of the most distinctive forms of any aircraft in history with its tubular fuselage, huge delta-wing planform, and underslung engines in its initial bomber form. The cockpit remained at the front of the fuselage, with huge forward canards straddling the crew area section. The six horizontally arranged engines were aspirated via two enormous angular intake apertures under the airplane. The wing main planes were located beneath the fuselage, but above the engines and any necessary intake ductwork. Two vertical fins were positioned outboard of the six rear engine exhaust ports. The wing main planes also included wingtips that could be bent downwards up to 65 degrees in flight for enhanced stability at supersonic speeds. The undercarriage consisted of two four-wheeled main legs and a two-wheeled nose leg. The legs were all seated within the aircraft's bottom structure. The XB-70's engine of choice was the General Electric YJ-93 GE-3 turbojet with afterburning capability at the expense of higher fuel consumption. 
The dry thrust output of each engine was 19,900 lbf, with the afterburning thrust reaching 28,800 in each engine. The overall performance comprised a top speed of 2,056 miles per hour up to Mach 3.1, a cruise speed of 2,000 mph Mach 3.0, a service ceiling of 77,250 feet, and a combat loan range of 4,288 miles. The Valkyrie's body was built using a honeycombed core wrapped in stainless steel panels, sandwich arrangement, with titanium utilized at high temperature areas, much heat was generated due to the aircraft's speeds altitudes. The aircraft was designed to take advantage of compression lift, a naturally occurring byproduct of flight that appeared at high speed high altitude and can employ some of the generated shock waves as high pressure air to generate additional lift. This approach provided the XB-70 a completely distinct appearance in comparison to other aircraft of the time, its sharp angles, the intake positioning, etc. Another high-speed design innovation that helped with directional stability while flying was the lowering of the wingtips. The XB-70 was supposed to have individual enclosed seats for emergency ejection. A whole cabin ejection system was also put through its paces. Missile defenses had been in operation since the 1950s, and by the 1960s, existing technology had rendered high-flying supersonic bombers like the XB-70 obsolete. This prompted officials to urge in late November 1959 that the XB-70 be revised as a strike reconnaissance vehicle to attack Soviet missile launchers. However, this strategy was not carried out, and the XB-70 program instead saw a limited development role as its initial value gradually dwindled. The establishment of America's own ICBM missile program further slowed the XB-70's development. The XB-70 program received funding for only one prototype in late 1959. Following widespread references to the XB-70 during the 1960 presidential campaign, popular support for the aircraft began to build. The XB-70 was given fresh life to the point that the USAF commissioned the production of an XB-70 prototype, which would be followed by 11 modified developmental vehicles designated as YB-70. In November 1960, funding was approved. Following John F. Kennedy's election victory over Richard Nixon, Kennedy's new administration decided to cancel the XB-70 bomber program entirely in March 1961, shifting American emphasis to missiles. It was decided to keep the XB-70 as a research and development product to investigate Mach 3 flight. A brief attempt to relaunch the XB-70 bomber program into a missile-carrying reconnaissance strike aircraft as the RS-70 was unsuccessful. This redesigned variant would retain its four-person crew and feature in-flight refueling. Despite the fact that three XB-70s were originally planned for the new program, the acquisition was eventually cut to two aircraft under the XB-70A name. The planes were designated as AV-1 and AV-2. AV-1 arrived in May 1964, followed by AV-2 in October. The AV-1 made its first flight on September 21, 1964. However, it was hampered by one engine failure and an undercarriage warning, forcing the crew to fly the enormous aircraft with its legs down. Furthermore, upon landing, the rear wheels along the port side of the aircraft locked in place, causing their rubber to rupture and a flame to ignite, an ominous start to the long-running operation. And that's it for today, guys. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please, click on the like button and share it with your friends and family. If you have any questions or comments, please share them with us in the comment space below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see even more of our incredible videos. You can also check out our other videos that have been specially selected for you. We'll catch up in the next video.